Welcome to Peopleverse. I'm your host, Evan Troxell, and I'm an architect. Peopleverse is a show where I talk with people throughout the building industry to unearth authentic stories from interesting people to entertain and inspire. You might have heard of the metaverse. Well, we're doing something different here. In many ways, the building industry is still very much like the Wild West, even in a time when technology and data are abundant. Peopleverse explores the people and the stories behind the projects to remind us why we got into this industry in the first place and to build relationships along the way. This show is brought to you by Tect, and you can learn more about what we're doing to connect the supply and demand sides of the building industry at tech.com. And you can learn more about Peopleverse at peopleverse.fm. On today's episode of Peopleverse, I welcome Linda Thompson. Linda's worked in areas of customer liaison, software training and development, and qualitative market and social research over the last 30 years. Understanding customers' motivations and their needs is at the forefront of what she does. She's driven by the desire to facilitate communication and collaboration across the many disciplines in construction and to improve understanding of the jargon and acronyms used in the industry. There aren't, there aren't that many acronyms, are there? (laughs) Sometimes there are entire sentences of acronyms. It's, it's, (laughs) it's hilarious. She's worn many customer engagement hats over the years, mostly working in the built environment, which includes architecture and construction sectors. And much of that time was for NBS the UK National Building Specification. Now Linda works as an independent researcher and customer insight consultant and works for clients like product manufacturers, industry membership bodies like like Constructing Excellence and the Royal Institute of British Architects, also known as the RIBA, and more recently in the UK energy sector with the Fuel Bank Foundation. She likes nothing better than using various research techniques to find meaning in qualitative data and provide independent and actionable findings to decision makers. She identifies research questions and des- and decides on the best methods. Focus groups and interviews are her favorites to use to help organizations that yearn for a better understanding of their markets and customers. Linda, welcome to Peopleverse. It's great to Thank have you. Thank you. That was quite the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it, it, there's so many great things in there and I, you know, we're kindred spirits. We, we are working on bridging the gap between supply and demand. And I just, I think of, of the work that you do between supply and demand, mostly on the supply side of, of that, those two sides, it to help interpret, understand the whole puzzle, the bigger picture, rather, because so many times people get kind of stuck in their lane. And so, so again, there's so many great things in your bio. Before we start getting into that conversation, I wanted to ask you if there was something back from your childhood that looking back, you can, you can say that was, that led to where I am today. Yeah, I think, yeah, on reflection, it led to where I am today, but at the time didn't, I, I just thought, well, that's just silly. But I was, um, I'm not, I'm quite academic, but I was not as academic as my brother, who was particularly academic. And um, my mum always used to reassure me by saying, but you're a people person, Linda. And I was like, well, okay, whatever. <laughs> Didn't really think that that was a good thing. Um, but yeah, absolutely, on reflection, that has been an asset over the years and is, has entirely led to me doing what I do now. Absolutely. I do think that like when we're young and, and people point out things like that, that can come from their, they notice it from their bigger experience, they observe it and they can see how maybe that would work to your benefit, right? Yeah. It's so hard at those early stages to foresee where that could lead and how it could even benefit you. It's like you, you have this tool you and you don't even know how to use it. You don't know no. where it's going to go. No. And to be fair, it takes um, experience and maturity, I think, to really get a handle on how to deal with other people, because there's so many other people in the world. <laughs> well, you said you're a people person, and this is the People Verse podcast. There's a lot of uh, plosives in that sentence, but this is the core of, I think, what we think is going to unlock a lot of 
the things that are locked up in the building industry, which is talking to people and and beyond talking, right? But but really pulling the information out, interpreting it and conveying it to others, transferring that wisdom. Uh, and you sit in the middle of a lot of these conversations, you're doing re- research, right? And I think I on one of our earlier calls, we talked about the difference between what people think is research, which is really just searching the internet for information uh, in many cases versus research. And so maybe you can give us an idea of how you got to this point in your career where you really are able to dig deep, build trust with those teams and give them information that they're kind of sitting on, but didn't even necessarily know that they had. Yeah. And I think it probably comes down to actually having a bit of distance Um, And I don't think I appreciated that when I first started working in this industry because I felt like I needed to know everything about construction and the built environment and understand all the technicalities, all the acronyms, all the jargon. Um, And actually, it's to my, it's benefited me not to, (laughs) which sounds bizarre, but, um, but absolutely, it makes sense. It's made sense to me over the years to actually have some impartiality and have some independence because I've done, I've done software training of specification products and I've done and focus groups with architects talking to manufacturers and actually it never matters that I don't know how to do their jobs because I know how to do mine and mine is actually yes to talk to people which is what you've just said but actually more importantly to listen um, and to really give people the opportunity to have a voice and to speak Um, and it's quite hard to do that um, and to actually hear what they have to say or to hear what they have what's what they're saying underneath um, which isn't always necessarily, you know, the obvious. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all about knowing how to talk to people, knowing how to question people, knowing how to listen. Um, and I think it came from, I started out in the ticketing industry, nothing to do with construction. Um, and I used to go and install box office systems all around the country. Um, and I used to be that person who would just go there for two weeks, transfer all of their tickets onto a new system and, and get them through the training and, of the new system. And then I'd leave. And looking back on it now, I was immersing myself in what they did and, you know, used to stand outside and smoke with them. Don't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that was how I got the gossip. I became a member of their team, in a sense. And then I would leave and I'd take back feedback on the product back to the software company. Um, then I transferred into construction related things and worked for the MBS for a long time and, and taught people how to use the specification products. Um, and all the time I was gathering feedback on how they were using the products and the problems they had and the issues that they had with the products and bringing that back into the business to improve the product um, and worked in the product development team then. And then just sort of naturally fell into the market research team because I went on maternity leave and came back and no one quite knew what to do with me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where I where I ended up. It's so interesting to think about how you got to where you are. And I, I feel like there's uh, there's so many directions we could go with that. When you talked about delivering and setting up the box offices, I, it's not unlike the architectural delivery process and how architects are involved. They yeah. they follow the project through construction. And as soon as those keys are handed over, it's like, okay, next one, right? And And there's still so much to learn because we've talked about it on this show. We've talked about it on my other podcast, which is, Buildings are prototypes. They are a series of decisions that have been put into place based on how we think it's going to work. And then the relationship, it's not like that relationship ends at that point, but that process for an architect typically ends at that point for that client, unless you have, you know, unless it's a campus or some larger, you know, phased out project. But for the most part, there's still so much to learn. And I think that's where you're coming in is you're coming in with, People are sharing their experiences. They're sharing how they're actually using whatever it is and or how they think that their message is even landing with another audience. And and then you're actually able to kind of dig in and help interpret or enable them to see what's actually happening from another person's point of view, which to a product manufacturer I could see could be extremely valuable because we all get in our silos. We all get in our, our tunnel vision of, doing what we do. And I think there very much is a adversarial relationship a lot of times between supply and demand. And that comes from lots of experience and baggage and all those things where, you know, I got burned once by this one guy who treated me like I was walking onto a used car lot. And therefore I now categorize many salespeople in that camp, 
even if that's not the case, right? And so there's there's kind of these natural divides, and that's just one example of the type of baggage I'm, I'm talking about. And and yet, building product manufacturers are trying to get people to see the value in the wares that they have, the offerings, the the products, the assemblies, the how they're dealing with energy codes and sustainability and red lists and all of these things that are that are going on that that are pressures in the world. And if somebody doesn't want to hear it, they don't want to hear it. So how do they start to really, how do you bridge that gap? How do you get people aware of those things? And so, you know, you, you sit between, and like you said, you, you really listen. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear the kinds of, let's just categorize these as kind of universal things that you hear from lots of, doesn't really matter what product category, doesn't necessarily even matter what product. But there's kind of these universal truths that I'm sure you hear time and time again, as as we do at Tech, yeah. of behavior, assumptions, uh, you know, jargon. Like you said, like we we'll just rattle off vocabulary as if everybody understands it, and they and they don't take that naive approach that that you say you're in a luxurious position to be in to say what is that, right? Because somebody doesn't want to look stupid in air quotes, right? Like, so, so they just let it flow and then, and then they, they never understand it. So I would love to hear from you some, let's just go through some examples of the kind of universal things that you hear time and time again, that really need to be addressed inside the building industry. Yeah. And I think, um, so I am always that person in the room who goes, uh, hang on, what do you mean? What did you just say? Could you repeat that? Because you will never ever be the person that people hate because you will always be the person that everyone is reassured you asked that <laughs> because they really wanted to ask it themselves, but they weren't sure and yeah, they didn't dare. So yeah. I'm that one. I'm that person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every time. Um, so yeah, I think there are some, some key things here. That, and if you take it from, if you look at it from the, the specifiers perspective and un, under that umbrella, I'm talking about architects, engineers, landscape architects, structural engineers, every, anyone who's specifying um, products and and specific and doing writing specifications. I think one of the real really huge challenges that they have is keeping up to date with information. There's so much going on, and I think a lot of the time, although they are specific, the professionals specific to their trade, as it were, um, they're generalists as well. They're trying to deal. Well, you know this that you're trying to deal with so many different things Absolutely. that actually specifications are just a little bit of it. Um, and yes, I mean, to me, for years working for MBS, that was huge. It was really important to me and to the business I worked for. But actually, to you, writing a specification is nowhere near as, you know, a bigger thing as the rest of the things you have to deal with. So one of the things that I think is really important for product manufacturers is they know their products. They know their systems. They know their market. They understand so much about what they do. They're the experts. Um, and so I think it's important for them to be able to educate the people who need the information. But of course, they've got to get to them at the right time. Mm -hmm. And that's the real issue, you know, and I think I've, I've been at um, continuing professional development, so CPD events before where manufacturers have been presenting and um, educating specifiers. Um, and at the time, often I think it feels to the, the specifier, to the architect or to the engineer that, the timing's not right. They don't need to know about that product at that specific time. But actually, if something resonates, they'll remember that manufacturer, you know, and they'll remember the person who did the presentation. And if they're technical enough and they really understand what they're talking about and talk to the architects at the right level, then that architect will go back to them when they need to specify that product, I think. Um, so, yeah, I think it, there's a real opportunity for manufacturers to, to educate. Um, and I've done focus groups before where manufacturers have had an opportunity to talk to architects in a room um, and they've had the chance to hear those architects talk about their products their competitors products talk about you know keeping up to date with regulations and standards and and realized for example that there's an opportunity to educate the architects in relation to the changes to part l for example of the building regulations in relation to their insulation um, because they can see the architects talking to each other in that group and and that actually the architects don't realize that something's changing in three months because they can't keep up with it all. So that there's a perfect opportunity there for them. But also uh, architects and engineers and so on are so busy. 
they're so busy and they've got so much to deal with that I think it's really hard for, for anyone to actually talk to them, you know, manufacturers aside. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's a an issue there with getting to speak to them at the right time. Well, one of the things that that we talk about at Tech is that not not only are that like, like let's just talk about lunch and learns for a moment. Like the, the idea of a lunch and learn is to go in and blast people with a bunch of information. And and to your point, it's it's typically not the right timing for anybody in that room. A lot of times they're showing up for the free lunch, but there's definitely people there who are there for the information. But to, but to your point, to file it away for later. Yeah. And and if and when the opportunity arises and. Building product manufacturers are typically incentivized by sales, right? To because that's what they're doing. They're selling products, and they're not necessarily thinking about it from a educational standpoint. I know many are, so it, it's hard to have this conversation. And, and I can't, it, you can't just generalize everything, but but the the idea here that they're proactively going out to educate people at the wrong time about something that they don't even know if it's appropriate for any of the projects that are being worked on in an office at that time, it just doesn't seem like, like I can't imagine what the ROI on that process is, right? <laughs> and so thinking about it from that standpoint and thinking about like what actually needs to change in that, it does make a lot of sense for people to provide resources, thought leadership, heads up on the types of things you're talking about like oh a big change is coming in x number of months you need to be aware of this and i'm i'm happy to help you do that but 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 be in a kind of a receiving situation rather than a going out and and trying to knock people over the head with with bats right because yeah. that is i think that's leading to the behavioral issues that we see from architects which is like stay away there's a locked gate there's actually three a locked gate in front of another locked gate in front of another locked gate i don't want to hear from you yeah. because i've got 300 things to worry about today but i think that probably comes down to building relationships and actually showing that you that that there's a common ground and that it's not adver adversarial it's not you know combative yeah. <laughs> you know that it's 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 a I hesitate to say friendship because it's professional but you know if if you know that a technical sales guy at a brick manufacturer really knows his stuff then you're going to go back to him when you need to know about that particular product mm -hmm. and and you'll remember them you know and it's about making those relationships and I think and well I know that I've spoken to various um specifiers in the past who have known that they can pick up the phone and ring that technical person and get what they need there and then right and th and that they'll go back again and again to that person because they've yeah. got what they needed when they needed it valuable shortcut right yeah. <laughs> personal yeah. business card uh I, I i totally agree with that and i mean that's the idea behind this show is to help just surface and expose the the great people who are out there in the building industry to it's not like I'm kidding myself and thinking that people will build relationships by listening to the show, but they might be interested to know someone because they got exposed to them from this show. And that could lead to relationships. And that's yeah. really, you know, you being kind of an important bridge between the two sides is, is are also a really important person to have at that table. How do building product manufacturers take the feedback when you say it's a book? Or do they already know? It's all about relationships. I don't want to assume anything. I think on the whole, they do know that. But it's really interesting, actually, the, the distinction between, um, for example, having a roundtable conversation with a with a panel of experts or having a focus group with um, a group of architects, let's say six or seven architects, um, and the difference between having the manufacturer there, either behind um, the glass where the participants can't see them or forget about them or in the literally in the room um, versus not being there and me then taking all of the feedback on board and feeding it back to the manufacturer and there's a definite there's reasons for both definitely um, and there's there's in some ways it's better when the manufacturer is not there because then the architects really are open and honest and, and you get a good conversation going where they're not 
thinking about the fact that the manufacturers in the room um but equally i've been in the room with manufacturers and architects before now where a really great discussion's got going and Sometimes I have to bring it back because they go off track and, and forget that actually they're paying me to find specific things out. And actually, if we go off track and we use the time talking about another thing, then they're not getting the money's worth out of me. Um, but it's yeah, it can be it can be really interesting to, for example, for a manufacturer to be in the room and hear a group of architects talk, for example, about cavity wall insulation, let's say, um, and name that manufacturer's competitors and talk about how they use it, how they're specifying them, how they're getting substituted or whatever. Um, and the manufacturer literally hearing that in the room. I mean, you can't, that's priceless. Absolutely. What other kinds of interactions have you, that would be worth talking about to, to the two audiences that we're, that we're addressing right now that you've surfaced through, through the years of doing what you're doing as this liaison? So there's the, the kind of, there's the relationship side and the collaboration and the the need for um learning from each other um and then there's also the um the i think it's really helpful for architects and specifiers to be able to see things like case studies and real examples of how products are used and not just pretty pictures but you know conversations about that video you know that kind of thing if they if they can access that kind of thing when they're looking for the information if they can find it at the right time or be pointed at it when they're asking for that information because they need to specify something then that's really amazing because and especially now i mean when you think of all the things that we can produce now in terms of being visual and you know architects and engineers are really visual people and very practical people as well so they're not they're not just interested in the spiel and the 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 spin <laughs> you know they and I, I hesitate to call it marketing speak because that's not a bad thing um but you know they they want they want the detail they want the technical detail right and they want to be able to see it in action as well and that's so that's really part of the education piece i think and and it raises awareness it's still publicity pr it's still advertising in a way i always remember very clearly that when we were when we had manufacturers clause data and things like BIM objects in the in the MBS, the, the money that manufacturers were spending was advertising money. Right. It was their advertising budget. Mm -hmm. But that always felt really uncomfortable to us because it was it was specific at the point of specification. You had the clause information for that product when you needed it. You had the BIM objects when you needed to, to put them into your model. And it, that's not advertising. That's technical specification. <laughs> it really blurs the line. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering from the manufacturer side, were there insights derived from these interactions with architects, for example, to, to show them what architects actually need when they need it to understand the context that they could be coming to a manufacturer within? There's a huge, there's, there's so many variations in there. Like an architect could be at conceptual design or they could be at design development and need completely different things from a building product manufacturer did the manufacturers, building product manufacturers, were they able to kind of understand that what the life of an architect is like, how many products oh, yeah. they're dealing with, what the absolutely. assemblies are? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And that, I mean, that was part of our responsibility when I when I worked at MBS, and part of my responsibility now. If you don't understand your audience, if you don't understand the people that you're trying to effectively sell to, then you can't you can't effectively satisfy their needs at all one of the avenues that building product manufacturers have to get the information out beyond the personal in-office lunch and learn or webinar or whatever is their website and i think you know i think definitely have seen a lot of allergic reactions to finding building product information on websites because of they're all different the information is structured differently. It's not the audience is not necessarily the design professional. Many times it, it could be the contractor, for instance. Um, and then a lot of times they're met with having to put in their personal or professional information to even talk to somebody to get a question answered. And and again, if I'm an architect, which you know I've done this many times, I'm during conceptual design, just just trying to find a direction on a project and not get specific on a product and I want to kick the tires on it, there's no way I want to give up all that information just to have a conversation to see if this might be possible. So I'm just wondering from 
the conversations that you've had with the building product manufacturing side, how do they, and I get it, sales reps aren't in charge of all that stuff, right? So I, I understand that like they don't get to decide how the company spends its money on its website or what the structure is or what gets presented to who. So I'm just wondering kind of how we start to make sense of this and, and how, how building product manufacturers react to that kind of day-to-day experience that an architect or a design professional might surface in a conversation like you're having. I think there's two things there. One, one is that I absolutely think that manufacturers are far, far more aware of what specifiers need than they ever were. And websites are far better than they ever were sure. now, That, in my experience. Um, and, and also, I think they're much better now at, well, providers, product manufacturers are much better now at making sure that the person who has that technical knowledge and experience and understanding is accessible and able to react and talk to the specifier when they need to. And I think, I, I also believe and, and know for sure that marketing teams at and comms teams at manufacturers now are far more technical than they ever were and know so much more about those products. It, I just think websites, manufacturers websites are just incredibly efficient now compared to what they used to be you know and that's that's come about i think because of the learning that i might have facilitated in some instances um but that you know that they are it shows that they are listening and it shows that they are communicating as well and i think and especially when you look at things happening in our industry that are catastrophic things like the the grenfell fire in, t- in 2017 you you can't you can't waffle you can't not get it right it's just not acceptable anymore <laughs> right oftentimes bringing these two sides together there's there's a way to unlock kind of a group genius when it comes to ideating around a product around a category understanding what the possibilities are how do we in your experience work together to foster that kind of a situation more often because i really feel like it's those types of situations that will break down the barriers that many people foster from years and years of bad experiences. How can we yeah. start to overcome that or yeah. or show that that's a really useful outcome of these kinds of conversations, meetings, work sessions, whatever you want to yeah. call them? From my perspective, the best way to do that is to be employed to run, uh, to moderate groups where they are, um, it, the participants all know that everything is confidential and, and anonymous. And so they are then fully open and you, I pass on the feedback, I pass on quotes, I pass on the themes that are coming out and I pull out, I tease out the, the detail, but people's comments are not attributed to them. Mm. And you would not believe how much of a difference that makes to people because they then know it's, it's, they become, it's this whole, what is it? Storming, forming, Norman, I can't remember all the different parts of group <laughs> um, dynamic, but you know, they, there's this initial concern about who's in the room and 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 to be completely honest and open when i first started working at mbs they wouldn't put manufacturers and specifiers in the same room Mm. i was like why why would we not do that that's really useful and it was there was a real resistance to it and that changed over the years and i was there quite a while so there came a point where we absolutely had those people in the same room and we had contractors we had quantity surveyors we had you know we had the project team in the room and we could discuss these things in great detail um, but if you if you do have the opportunity to run these kind of groups where you explain to people this is a safe space, then you find out so much more. And it's it's then you still feed it all back, but you just don't say you know Bob from Gilmore Architects said this, you know, because it make it you know. And if you do specifically want to feed something back or something needs following up because Bob actually wants to know about the minutia of cavity wall insulation, then yes, you ask the participant if they mind having their details passed on. And then, you know, if they say yes, it's fine. Um, but yes, it's all part of this kind of code of conduct that I live, not live by, work by, <laughs> um, because of my quality, you know, my professional um, background. Yeah, it's interesting to think of a, a session like that as as a way to unlock that kind of group genius to unlock new ideas new things that 
even even to your point earlier on about just being able to ask the question that everybody wants to ask, but everybody is afraid to ask because they don't want to be perceived also, in a certain it's way. It's also about finding out the stuff that you didn't know you needed to know. You know, I mean, you can I can spend hours trying to come up with a discussion guide for a group and half the time it goes out the window because you start the discussion and you realize that things are coming out you hadn't anticipated. Um, but you see, if, if the manufacturer tried to run a group like that, they wouldn't, they would, well, not intentionally, but they would lead the discussion. They would ask the things they wanted to find out. They'd often have, they'd come with bias or come with assumptions. Um, but the, the best groups are when you ab absolutely find out the stuff that you just had no idea was going to come out. That makes me think of, of two different kind of smaller topics that I, that I want to talk about. One, I think, is is the situations you've been in. Are, are some of them created to confirm what somebody already thinks at least that's their goal is, is to they they want to they want confirmation that what they're doing is what they want right versus yeah. what what the actual potentially could be yeah and actually one of my not it wasn't a hard piece of work to do but one of the hardest things for me to have to tell the business was bad news that basically the product they thought that they really needed to develop, that they thought everyone would love and would be really useful, was actually not viable at all. It was other people were doing it far better. The the considered opinion was don't go there, you know, put your efforts elsewhere. Um, and I had to give that feedback. And it at the time it just felt like I was giving bad news, and I and everyone was so kind of like, oh, this is I can't wait, we can't wait to develop this product. And I was like, I don't really think you need to. Um, and actually, to their credit, they you know. They acknowledged it and they they didn't do it and it was the right decision but that was yeah i found that really hard to do because you you don't want to give people bad news you want to give people good news obviously right. but yeah right. i mean you don't I, one of my one of my big bugbears is when someone gives me a brief and basically tells me what they want me to find out that's yeah. like red rad to a bull to me i'm like right bring it on <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get this we're gonna get to the nitty-gritty of why you think that and why you want to find that out and we're gonna see whether or not people really do agree with that. And it's you have to be really careful with your questioning, obviously. Well, and the other mini topic was something you said a few minutes ago regarding, I think this happens a lot on the demand side. So I, I feel like this is a, a great thing to point out, which is many times we don't even know the right question to ask. So you, you, you said something to that effect earlier. Do you have any examples of, of things like that or, or just scenarios that loosely go around that to kind of, just talk about the importance of having those safe places to have these conversations so that things like this, like I didn't even know that I should have asked about about that topic when talking about this product or this product category. And, and I feel like so many times there's, when we're doing design, we have a sense or an intuition about where we're going and we don't even necessarily know why. And so we definitely don't know what the right questions are to ask when we're starting on that process. This also links really strongly, actually, to not not easily being able to keep up with what's new mm -hmm. and the fact that actually a product that you've used for years very successfully, um, you know, and when you, you may well have done post-occupancy evaluations, you may well have followed up and, and you know, gone back to places, gone back to buildings you built four years ago or whatever, and, and, real, and you know, discovered in, and, and been quite happy with that, how that product performed. Um, but how would you know that that product could be better? And that someone had produced something that was, I don't know, potentially more sustainable or, you know, had better longevity. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you don't. How are you going to know that? Because there's so much information out there. Um, so that it kind of yeah, it links to that a bit, I think. Well, just just kind of unlocking the idea that I don't even necessarily know the right questions to ask. I do feel like on the building product manufacturer side, because of the experience that they have and the expertise that they do have they are in a special position to say, here are the things that you absolutely need to know, and here's the questions you need to ask based on location, yeah. assembly type, other structural type. Like, there's just so many variables that they can actually hold up their hand and say, here's the question you should be asking. And it doesn't mean that there's necessarily answers right then, but but as you embark on this process. Yeah, what, what's really useful here is to to keep your questioning really open and to pause and wait and listen and allow the people in the group to, to bounce off each other and actually 
then begin to probe where you want to get to with that question. So keep it really, really open and then get go deeper. Um, and sometimes even just say things like how how would something like um you know how does it make you feel if if joe in this or in this group who does smaller projects than you when they say that actually they specify that product all the time and never ever look anywhere else they never even try and look for something new because they haven't got the time how does that make the rest of you feel that sorry it's not a very good example but that that kind of you know making a discussion happen because you've you've highlighted something one one person said um but it's a lot of it is genuinely just thinking on my feet as mm -hmm. as the discussion ensues but the most important thing for me and this is crucial and i think this goes back to i trained as a primary school teacher and it, when when we and i didn't teach in the end um we had to plan our lessons and we had objectives for those lessons and then at the end of the lesson you went back and evaluated whether or not you'd met those, those, those objectives and with research projects, I always have a set of objectives that I have the person who's commissioning the research, whether that's the product manufacturer or a client or whoever, I always get them to check those objectives. By the end of this research, we will have understood so-and-so or documented this or whatever. Um, and so in my mind, I always, re I always read them back to myself before I start a focus group or do depth interviews. And I always refer back to those objectives throughout the entire process. Because if I don't keep going back to those, and also if they don't get agreed by all the stakeholders, um, you can't do the research, you can't fulfill the project, you can't, because, and, and this actually, this used to happen quite a lot um, when I was working at MBS, because if you didn't keep that focused, you'd then get a director coming in and saying, well, just while you've got these people in a room, while you've got mm. those manufacturers there, or while you've got those architects there, can you ask them this? And you're like, well, yes, I can, <laughs> but that may not mean you get what you originally asked for. <laughs> so let's let's transition and talk about what the process is actually like for somebody who would hire you to do what you do. I mean, I I'm fascinated to know kind of if you could paint a picture of what that looks like, so that because I I think it's really valuable. Obviously, I, I have you on the show. I, this is. We do need to bridge the gap more often. We need to find ways to bridge the gap more often. And I feel like this is a, a really actionable way to do that. And so let's give people an idea of what that actually trans how that transpires. Yeah, but ultimately it's about having conversations. Um, and that doesn't have to be about a formal research project. And um, if I'm doing a formal research project, then the ideal scenario is that someone gives me a brief I respond to that brief by saying, I think this would be best done with phone interviews or focus groups in person or online, or you might need some desktop research or a liter literature review, um, or you might need a survey. Um, and that could be so that's a it could be a mix of qualitative or quantitative um, research. Um, it really depends on what it is they're trying to find out. Um, and I hate that expression, it depends. <laughs> Because it's yeah. really unspecific, but um, there is it is nuanced. I mean, there's so many, yeah. so many different variables in that equation. Yeah, and actually, um, sometimes so some people know how to commission research and will give me an amazing brief. I had one mm. the other day, which was really, really specific, really clear. I knew exactly how to respond to it. I knew exactly what they needed. They'd also made some suggestions about what they thought they needed because they understand about doing research. Um, but then there are the people who, who don't really know what they want to know and don't really know who to ask and don't know how to go about it. Um, mm. And I can absolutely help with that as well, because if I understand a bit about what it, what their challenges are, then I can make recommendations for the sample, who we speak to, how we go about it and how I then report back. Um, and there are various different methods of doing research. Um, and the interesting thing about research as well, um, which... I didn't realize until I started doing it was that some people do real full on academic research mm -hmm. and some people do what I've done over the years, which is sort of customer and market research. Um, but there's, there's other types as well. And I've actually started more recently to do social research, which is a whole other thing entirely, um, but uses the same methods. Ultimately, you said a word earlier and it's coming back to me now. There's the idea of asking questions, but having that bias and either wanting to confirm your bias or not even being aware that the bias is in the question. Do you have maybe an example of a question that somebody might want you to ask versus the way that it should be asked 
based on the type of work that you do. Putting you on the spot here, I, I realize, but but like you, you get yeah. where I'm going with this, which is I think there's a lot of times where, as an architect myself, or or as a technology person, and 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 I can ask a question of an architect because I'm an architect, and and they'll answer me, and I'll just nod like, "Yep, that's totally how I feel," but I didn't even ask the right question, and and to me, you being in that position of sitting between and not knowing all the details of what it's like to do that thing on a day-to-day basis you don't ha- you never have to nod along and say yep totally because then i don't it doesn't lead to the next follow-up question it wasn't maybe the right question to start with and it doesn't lead to me digging any deeper either and so i'm just wondering from your experience like as as you're not an architect you're not trained in that way or you're not trained as a, a salesperson in, in building products so asking an unbiased question is obviously a great starting point but then the ability to dig deeper and i can imagine like a lot of times people will say i want to know the answer to this and and you're saying well to get there we have to go around and we have to do this real squiggly way to get to the information that you want yeah and so often i will ask questions in such an open fashion that actually the the the, the lovely sweet spot is when people in the group or in in an interview start telling you what it is you're trying to find out without you having asked a specific question in a in a specific way so i often play on and actually i've done this for years i've played on my naivety played on my lack of understanding and because i'm genuinely curious um and i don't and it it means then that the people i'm asking the question don't feel even remotely threatened by me or worried that they're going to be too technical or or not technical enough because it's it's kind of a it's an open safe place i don't i thing is this is the kind of thing i can't articulate i don't know how i do it yeah yeah it just happens uh, yeah so if somebody <laughs> could tell me how to articulate that and sell myself that'd be great <laughs> yeah <laughs> you take a, all the advice i would love that <laughs> I, I really feel like there's so many times that i will assume something when I'm looking for a product and it automatically disqualifies potential things that would work, but because I've made an assumption about a thing, and I would imagine that this maybe is at the root of some of the people who have hired you to figure out how to unlock, because yeah. me having my experiences, and those are going to be different than the person sitting next to me, we could receive a message two completely different ways. I, I could block it completely where somebody else yeah. could be totally open to receiving that. What, yeah. Can you maybe speak to any examples like that that have happened in in the work that you've done to to figuring out ways to unlock value in products or have them be seen in new ways that make sense to other manufacturers out there who didn't hire you, for instance? Um, yeah, so I think I've been in situations before where I've, I think it's helpful sometimes when you talk to different parties. So you don't just have the specifiers in the room you have the other parties in the room. So it might be that you have the subcontractors, you have the contractors. So for example, if you were talking about this is how a product was specified, or in fact, a product wasn't specified, but it was described, um, and actually only a certain product could satisfy that description Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because they had something in mind, but they weren't weren't supposed to specify that actual product. and then if you have that conversation, make it about a specific project and talk to the, the people who are doing the costing and the people who work for the contractor, and you actually end up having a conversation about why that product, or rather the product that the designer had in mind wasn't used and why, those conversations can be really, really helpful because you've you've got people talking about their site. You mentioned silos before. And it can really identify the issues that are going on in terms of the communication and the, the lack of collaboration with, you know, with the, with one product, with one, yeah. you know, describing one product in a specification because you think it's a no brainer to use that product. Right. Um, but actually, it's there's so much else going on. You know, there's the client requirements. There's, you know, there's so much going on, you know, Code and requirements. Yeah, 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 absolutely. yeah. geographical location, etc. I mean, it, it becomes it's so complex and that sometimes I can't really work out how we managed to build anything. 
<laughs> yeah, I totally know. know yeah, and then, and then I then I watch you know these B one M videos of these amazing projects that get built, and they speed them up, and you just think, yeah, it's not really that fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, years, years, and years, and years. Yeah. You said something about like having all of these various I, stakeholders is kind of a weird way to put this, but but players in. Participants, the team, yeah, yeah, participants, and having those various blind spots exposed, uh, having the various experiences, positive and or negative, um, all the way from, you know, the architect to the builder, um, having having input in that process, it, it makes me think of the timeline of any project, and how the lack of trust does exist between supply and demand side when it, when we're talking about design professionals and building product manufacturers and and we firmly believe that earlier participation is better and so we're trying to find ways to break down those barriers by building relationships so that I do call the right person at the right time for the information I need when I need it um just speaking to that early keyword in that sentence is that something that is on the building product manufacturer's radar? If so, how much? Because I, a lot, a lot of the effort of a building product manufacturer, I assume, and maybe this is wrong, is spent on the latter part of the project. Right? It's what projects are going out to bid, what projects are under construction, where substitutions are being considered, et cetera. Like yeah. versus the early part, which yeah. is when that impact can be so much greater. We feel, and and as an architect, I know in my bones that if I can get that information embedded into the project earlier, not only does it have a better chance of being in the project, but the project will be better because of the ripple effects that, that that information has early on. So I, I was just wondering if you can speak to any of that. I think, um, well, I know that manufacturers get involved far earlier now than they ever did. Um, but it really ultimately depends on the contractual circumstances and the procurement methods being used. Um, so I, so now, for, for absolutely on special, particularly major projects the team at the beginning at the outset at client requirement stage involves the manufacturers in many cases now more so than it ever did before and, and that's here in this country um, and that that makes a huge difference because they're part of the team you know and they know right. about their specifics um, and then you know they move on once the project progresses but they have to stay in touch as the project progresses because what, what you don't want is for then things obviously projects here not here everywhere are so um protracted in terms of time mm -hmm. that things change um, and we're not very good at change management i don't think in our industry we're not very good at <laughs> understatement at, at reacting, of the episode yeah, yeah <laughs> not very good at reacting to the fact that stuff changes <laughs> and that, but that's okay but yeah. yeah, dealing with that is is problematic because then as soon as I don't know something changes in terms of what the client thought they were getting, but actually they realised it's not quite what they wanted, or you know, in in terms of public procurement and government changing every however often, and you know that that causes problems as well. Um, and yeah. but even on smaller projects, I mean, one of the things I find really fascinating about um the work that you do is that when you're dealing with domestic clients. You can be sat in a room with, you know, a family and, uh, you know, asking them what they want out of their new house you're going to build them. And then they sit there all contradicting each other. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you're you like, have to somehow make okay. sense of all that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, it, it's a problem that has to be solved. And that's, uh, that's what we do. We, we solve we're problems. Problem we're licensed yeah. problem solvers. That's what we say. <laughs> I think a lot of people say, I'm, I'm an architect. I do. No, I, we can solve lots of different kinds of problems. Yeah. It's interesting to think about it that way. You, yeah. you mentioned, you know, delivery type. And I I think about how there is more of a willingness for somebody on the supply side to get involved if the delivery type is amenable to their input to equating to sales later on of, of said product. So that could be design build. It could be IPD. But, but the majority of my experience is on public, what we call public projects, which yeah. is you have to list you know, a basis of design and, and alternates. And so there's no guarantees. And I'm just wondering what your experience or what you've heard working with product manufacturers who either are, are willing or are not as willing to 
get involved with their expertise early on to help the design teams make decisions, even with the high likelihood that their product won't be selected. Um, and, and how that whole, you know, process, thought process, participation process plays into the ecosystem of the building industry. It's really challenging for them, I think. And I've come across quite a lot of fairly more, the larger manufacturers on the whole, who have different teams of technical advisors, te a team who deal, who, who liaise with the specifiers and a team who liaise with the contractors because they're dealing it with different stages. They're dealing with design stages and specifying the product at that point. And then the, they're dealing with well, what's happening at contractual side, you know, what the contractor's doing and whether or not they're deciding that actually what's been specified needs to change for whatever reason, whether that's cost or suitability or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, it, I mean, it's really, really challenging for manufacturers. And obviously the smaller ones or the newer ones or the more, the innovative ones that are now coming in solving problems that need solving in in relation to sustainability and climate change for example i mean that must be baffling for them um to try and deal with this but in terms of one of the things that we learned at mbs was that if in specifications if you're not i mean the, the clues in the word spec specify specific um if you're not specific about what you want to be used in your design um and it can be satisfied by multiple different products at different prices, then what's the contractor going to do? They're probably going to go for the cheapest one. Not necessarily, but again, it comes to it comes back to collaborating and involving each other and talking to each other. You know, if the contractor's involved at an early stage and the subcontractors and anyone else involved in the project is involved earlier on and understands the decision making. This is one of the things I just have never been able to get my head around and it's kind of my I don't know, my magic wand thing. What why is it that we can't actually record and track that decision making and those conversations, you know, and why a decision was made? Because there could be really good reason for it. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. absolutely you should not change that product because there was, right. you know, a, there was a point. <laughs> you, right. you, you did a lot of research at the design stage. You specified that product for a reason. If you record somewhere, which you can in MBS, you record why you chose that product, um, then surely that makes it easier down the line to to keep it in to justify yeah yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. you'd think <laughs> you would think again being naive <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean it it's complicated right it's it's complicated relationship wise it's complicated process wise yeah. it's like you said it's a miracle that things get built at all and yet yeah. here we are dedicating our lives to this and and the outcomes of it. I well, yeah, and, and going, yeah, going impressive. back to change as well. I mean, supply chains at the moment are really, really suffering because of the pandemic and 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 the war in Ukraine and all sorts of different things that are going on in the world. Right. And mm -hmm. so, if we don't, I mean, that's going to have a knock-on effect later on, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and so, and we have to be able to deal with that. We have to be able to anticipate it, have backup plan, decide what you know, work out be what resilient. we do next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be resilient. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you know the. the Back to my question, as far as being freely giving with information, even potentially knowing like that your product's not going to be used, those are the best reps that I've ever worked with, are the ones who, in, in my case, came into the office, and because we had a large office, there's probably 250 people working on production on many different projects in many different stages, and, and they just come in and like set up office for half of a day and just talk to all the teams who do roofs on their buildings. Guess what? That's yeah. all the teams, right? And they're at various stages and they need various levels of information. And they're just there without saying, here's my product that's going to go in your building. We couldn't even guarantee that, right? But they were just there to help with all yeah. things roofing. And yeah. those to me were the... Like those are the people on my short list who I'm always going to call if it has something related to that category. If yeah. it's their, they have a whole suite of products. They have many different families of products. They've got different types. Like it could be metal. It could be single yeah. ply membrane roofing. It could be whatever. But I'm always going to call Keith because Keith is helpful. You're more likely to remember Keith and his products than the lunch he provided. Absolutely. And, and, and he would just come in once a month and, you know, there'd be... A, Keith's going to be in. Anybody who wants to talk to him, book a slot. And that's fantastic because as an architect, I can't know everything 
that I need to know. So I need to actually stop trying and just say, Keith, help. And Keith's like, I'm, I'm here for you, whatever that's you need. Because, that's because Keith took the time to understand his customers. And that, I think there's just a lesson in there. That, that to me is uh, the answer to the next question and the final question that I'm going to ask you today, which is if you could put a, a message on a billboard or I gave you a, a loudspeaker and you could blast the building industry with a message, uh, what, would you, what would you say to the building industry? Well, I, would, I thought I would say talk to each other, but actually I would say listen to each other. Um, and I would say as well, and I think that this is quite important because I think we've slightly lost the art of debate and disagreement. And so I think this sort of speaks to your point of someone coming in and telling you, talking to you about roofs for a half a day, um, but not necessarily to an end, you know, a specific project end, but that actually that's okay. And that as well, I think there's got to be instances where it's okay to disagree about procurement, meeting the regs, which product is suitable for what, because not everyone's going to agree, you know, whether or not pulling apart a system is going to make that system fail and why that, why that's problematic, you know, having, I think it's just okay to disagree and to be able to debate a point but to walk away knowing that actually someone else had a different point of view to you. And that's fine. And that leads to resilience. I, I believe like the, the only way that you can get there is through conversation. Yeah. So as you're saying, have those conversations. Yeah. I genuinely think that everyone's trying to keep everyone else so happy or content or okay that actually it, it means that but everything's taking longer than it needs to. And we're just, we're in this situation, I just think, I don't know, where people don't want, I hesitate to say confrontation because it doesn't need to be confrontational. It doesn't need to be argumentative. But I just, I don't know, I just think we've kind of lost that art of being able to appreciate that there are two points of view. And and that, I don't know, maybe I play a part in that, that I can put across the two points of view without everyone having to see the argument. <laughs> <laughs> but you know I mean it's yeah I just think it's a complex industry yeah and like you say you know and we've already talked about you know change being an issue and needing to be resilient I don't know I just and I know I I can be really naive, naive about these things I know that it's far more complex than I could ever possibly know but it's not that hard to talk to people and it's not that hard to actually hear what they're saying and listen and often people are you know people have got other stuff going on in their lives they don't just do the job that you're talking to them about they've got other stuff going on as well and i think sometimes we don't appreciate that well that that was a fantastic way to at least pause this conversation i i do look forward to more in the future with you all the time linda so i i want you to let everybody know and i will put everything uh, that you're about to say in the show notes so people don't have to remember it. They can just go to the show notes and click a link. But please tell everybody where they can find out more about what you're offering, what you do, uh, all things Linda Thompson research oriented here. And so, well, I'm on LinkedIn as Linda Thompson, not surprisingly, um, and you'll put the link below. And um, I'm on Twitter and it's L <laughs> it's one of those Twitter handles that you create and then you think, oh, I hate that, but now I can't change it. Um, so it's <laughs> LT customer first, but I think there's an underscore in there. But again, look down there below. Um, and my website is um, ltresearch.co.uk. Great. Well, again, thank you for joining me in the Peopleverse today, Linda. It's absolutely fantastic conversation thank i appreciate you. you so much so thank you very until much until next time take care hey before you go can you do one thing for me hit the like button it really does help us in the youtube universe watching all the way to the end is probably even more helpful so thank you for that too it all adds up and helps more people find the show these are great ways for you to help spread the word and contribute to the peopleverse if you want to help the channel even more, please subscribe and use that red button right down there and turn on the notification bell so that you'll know exactly when the next episode comes out. It's completely free to do so. And finally, 
Do you have something to add to this conversation? If you do, leave a comment. I read all of them. I can't wait to share the next conversation with you. So until then, see you soon. <laughs>